Okay, hi everybody. Let's talk about two motivational theories. Uh, everybody gets Herzberg wrong. Everybody does. Uh, it's a really hard theory to understand the basics of. And also, a really good theory. Is it my favorite motivational theory? I don't think so. I have a lot of favorites among the motivational theories, but I just want to highlight and elucidate my favorite theory, or one of my favorite theories. Go ahead, come on forward. And let me get my laser pointer. Wee-hee! Hi, Frederick. Okay, so everybody gets Herzberg wrong. What's the deal with that? Frederick Herzberg, 1966. There's Frederick. Uh, you know, published his motivator hygiene theory, or sometimes it's called the two-factor theory model. And, uh, you know, it explains work motivation and job satisfaction in terms of job duties and features of the workplace itself. This is a... Uh, content, uh, you know, uh, motivational theory about actually what's going on at work or the structure of things as opposed to cognitive or process theories. Uh, and so basically what the theory says, oh, I don't want a pointer anymore, I want a marker. Basically it says that meeting uh, motivators or meeting motivator needs produces satisfaction, and failure to meet hygiene needs promotes dissatisfaction. Notice that motivators are things that make people happier. The lack of hygiene factors are the things that make people unhappier. And then finally, his job enrichment part of the model talks about uh, how you use motivators uh, to basically enrich the jobs and make people happier. And I'll get back to that in a second. But first, let's go to where everybody gets it wrong, the motivator and the hygiene factors. So you should just be able to memorize the motivator factors. Uh, motivator factors in general are intrinsic, that is, internal to the work itself. They're about the actual work itself. So if we're talking about, you know, here at York, uh, the motivational factors or the motivator factors are associated with the work itself that is the going to class and studying and things like that. Uh, so uh, as I said before intrinsic such as the work itself uh, whether or not you can uh, you know achieve certain uh, you know things and be recognized for those things whether or not you personally find the work challenging and exciting to do, uh, if you're given greater responsibility at work, if you're given the chance for advancement and moving up, and likewise if you're given the chance for professional or personal growth. And so when these motivational factors are present, the result is greater motivation. So duh, motivation factors increase motivation, they increase satisfaction. However, the opposite, when motivational factors are not present, the result is nothing. So motivator, motivation, not nothing. Remember that. Challenging work leads to satisfaction, but its absence does not necessarily lead to job dissatisfaction. A great example of that, and a great example in terms of IO psychology and a career in IO psychology, is uh, Stacia. Uh, Stacia was a student of mine back in 1991, <laughs> and uh, she was a really good student at the first college I taught at, Wittenberg, and a couple years later when I was teaching at Wright State in the psychology department, uh, she was there in the IO psych program, and so she uh, got her master's in IO psych and very, very quickly got a job uh, with the state of Ohio Department of Education in the department that uh, uh, you know analyzes data and tracks data for uh, the education system. And I spoke to her, the last time I spoke to her on the phone was like maybe 98 or 99 and you know she said well yeah it's a good job and you know I get you know make a good amount of money and things like that uh, but it's it's kind of boring and I'm not really you know feeling motivated so I'm gonna look for another job and every time I go back now and check the uh, website for where she works I still I see she's still there 
And I think this is a great example of how uh, when the motivators are not present, nothing happens. That is, uh, she doesn't feel any motivators. The work, as she described it to me, uh, was not that challenging. She didn't feel, you know, that responsible about things. Uh, there wasn't much chance for advancement or growth. Uh, but I think the job probably uh, didn't have any uh, demotivators. So what she had was a situation where she had a boring job. But look at what happens when you have a boring job. You stick with it. And so that's an example of uh, motivators. Uh, and I'll get an example of uh, the other side of motivators in a little bit, I think. So, motivators motivate, no motivators, nothing. Hygiene factors are extrinsic to the work. Uh, that is, the work itself, the activity. So, that would be things not associated with work, such as uh, your relationship with your supervisors. Are you friends with your supervisors? Uh, do you feel they respect you? Do they yell at you? The attractiveness of the workplace. Uh, the location of the workplace. How generally it's uh, set up. The salary. Uh, how much money you make. Policies at work. And then the people at work and you know, whether or not you're friends with them. When hygiene factors are present, the result is nothing. When hygiene factors are not present, reduced motivation. I'm sorry, it's not something not like the other one where there's those two interesting, uh, you know, uh, pairs. But basically, remember, lack of hygiene factors demotivates. Lack of hygiene factors demotivates. But when hygiene factors are met, nothing happens. Uh, so. Let's take a look at, uh, for example, uh, York. So considering that college activities in terms of the intrinsic activities, studying, going to class, lectures, Blackboard, they're pretty much the same all across CUNY, all across most colleges. Uh, those are the motivational factors, the motivator factors. Uh, but when we look at York, and we look at your relationship with your supervisors, your relationship with your professors. Uh, the, CUNY does a uh, you know, survey of student uh, impressions every so often, every couple of years. And a lot of students don't feel really close to their professors at York as compared to other colleges, other CUNY campuses and other colleges in general. Uh, or, you know, of course, sal salary doesn't really uh, work into that. Uh, policy, you know, what policies do we have here at York that you like or dislike? Are the policies okay? Relationships, do you have friends here? Uh, and now, the pace de resistance, the attractiveness of the workplace. Uh, the physical plant here, and faculty know it, uh, the physical plant here is just falling apart. Uh, we have no food services this semester. Uh, the PAC Center is closed because of mold, and so classes that meet there uh, have found other places. Professors have offices over there, and they're not allowed to go to their offices. Uh, you know, uh, it's just falling apart. It's dirty often and not well kept. And so these are hygiene factors. So they're producing reduced motivation and students do see this they com the, and it also produces reduced satisfaction the things students complain about are not the classes themselves if you for example look at google and look at the reviews of york but they really complain about the campus and the environment and so these are the things that produce dissatisfaction when they are absent uh, but uh, piling more and more of these hygiene factors on does not create more and more motivation. And that's the key to understanding the two-factor theory. More hygiene factors will not motivate more. For example, uh, let's say that you're paying somebody less of a salary than the standard in the field. And 
well, salary is a hygiene factor, and so uh, if that's not being met, that will demotivate. And so without being paid uh, as much as you think you should be, that will demotivate and cause the person to do less work. So let's say that you pay them the same amount as others in the field. That will uh, remove that demotivator and they'll work more. Uh, so then you say, ah, so more money and paying people more and more money will create more and more motivation and more happiness and uh, more satisfaction and cause people to uh, work more. Well, if you're getting paid as much as other people and that means that you don't have that demotivator and you're working more then adding money does not really make you more motivated how can you do more work uh, you know there's you know a limit of you know if you work eight hours a day and they double you double your pay you don't start working 16 hours a day you just get paid a lot more and so that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about the hygiene factors don't motivate you to do more the lack of hygiene factors cause you to do less and to be you know critical and unhappy and as an example uh, an article came out in nature a couple years ago last year Jeb uh, Tay Diner uh, Ed Diner big uh, uh, important uh, psychologist in motivation and Oshi and they looked at not satisfaction but personal happiness and they looked at personal happiness across like uh, 1.6 million people it was a huge study and they looked at happiness and how much they were being paid and they discovered that uh, in the Western world if you're paid $95,000 a year that is what people need to be the most happier and if you make a hundred thousand if you make two hundred thousand you're no more happier than you were if you were making ninety five thousand make them less then you're unhappy and again that falls into the whole idea of salary being a hygiene factor uh, for people in Western cultures to feel like they're doing okay and be happy they need ninety five thousand dollars and if they have less than that they don't feel like they're okay and they're unhappy about it uh, and above getting paid more than ninety five thousand dollars doesn't really create more happiness and it doesn't create more motivation on the job so how do you motivate people when all the hygiene factors are are met somebody's making ninety five thousand dollars a year they're working at a really nice work uh, workplace that looks nice uh, they uh, have good supervisors they have good friends there well the way that you do that is you focus on motivators because motivators adding them in will cause people to do more work and be more excited about the work and so you go back to that list of motivators and achievement challenge responsibility advancement growth and work itself uh, changing those will make people who are making ninety five a hundred thousand dollars a year be more motivated and happy and excited about the job and so what you do is uh, you do job rotation so that they don't they are not doing the same job over and over again but they're trying new jobs and learning about new jobs uh, you give them new training activities you give them general growth activities uh, where uh, you allow people to go and volunteer their leadership experience with a nonprofit organization one day a week and that allows them to feel like they're growing as a person and as a leader and that will show up in more motivation and satisfaction on the job and then also you work look at achievements you give people awards you give people time off uh, as an award for their achievement so you have a plaque that you give people or you give them time off uh, my cousin the super saleswoman uh, she at one point in her career had like two years of time off that she earned through award you know through sales awards 
And so at one point, her and her husband decided to take a year off and go sailing, and they were able to do that. And that moti you know, motivated her. Well, I think Penny would be motivated anyway, but that was certainly uh, one of the things that motivated her. So that's how you motivate people. You motivate people by things intrinsic to the job itself. And the way that you avoid dissatisfaction is removing uh, you know, making sure that uh, demotivators are not present, that people are getting paid as they expect, that uh, you know, they have friends at work, they can socialize, they like the policies there, the workplace is clean. And of course you should read in the book about how Herzberg uses the job enrichment uh, part of his theory to talk about this and then also Hackman and Ullman uh, use their job characteristics model. Uh, to go about, uh, you know, based on uh, Herzberg's theory, to talk about specific things that you can change to uh, create better jobs. And then the, you know, Victor Vroom's expectancy theory model uh, is a process or a cognitive uh, motivational theory where basically there's a process or a cognitive process that goes on inside of people that determines their motivation. And this, I think, is a really cool theory that people don't realize exactly what it's saying. But what uh, the VIE model, the Valiance Instrumentality Expectancy model, uh, says is that people make choices based on their expectations that certain rewards will follow from certain behaviors. And so, uh, employee, you know, the theory says employees will perform at a level that gives them the greatest payoff, payoff or benefit. The worth of these rewards varies by individuals by their cognitive evaluation of what's going on. And effort or motivation is the result of their expectancy, their instrumentality, and their valiance. And let me describe what expectancy, instrumentality, and valiance are, uh, you know, specifically. Expectancy is that the, it's the result of the employee's decision whether they think their job behaviors have a high probability or a low probability of leading to a particular outcome. So expectancy is the relationship between their behavior and an outcome. That is, if I work harder at work, will the boss notice? And so the behavior is working harder, the outcome is boss noticing. Instrumentality is the employee's estimation uh, that you know, the outcome will be instrumental in leading to other outcomes and to leading to rewards. So if the boss notices me, that's the outcome, will that cause my boss instrumentality to give me a raise? And valiance uh, is the employee's uh, decision or evaluation of whether or not this reward is important to them or not. And so let's take a look at a process uh, diagram of the model. So we have the behavior, uh, which I said was working harder at work, the outcome, the boss noticing, and then the recognition. And uh, the arrow between behavior and outcome is the expectancy. Uh, the arrow between outcome and recognition is the instrumentality and the recognition itself is the valiance. And so basically a worker has to make an estimation, a cognitive estimation about what's the probability between zero and 100 percent. You try writing with a mouse. About if I work harder, uh, what pro what's the probability that my boss will notice? Is it like 10%, 20%, 100%, uh, okay. And then my boss notices that I'm working harder. Will he give me the recognition that I want, that is the raise, and uh, the relationship between that is instrumentality. That is, that's the estimation again, the percentage estimation that the employee is doing uh, based on do they think their boss will give them recognition, the reward, if they notice that they're doing a better job? And that could go from 0 to 100. And then finally, recognition. 
uh, this is the employee's evaluation of the uh, you know reward itself. Uh, if they want a raise of two dollars an hour, and that's what they really want, then the valiance would be one hundred percent. And so you know I said before, you just basically add up or multiply out those percentages, and that will give you a measure of the uh, you know uh, motivation of the uh, worker. Uh, so, for example, once when I was in grad school and working, uh, I was a waiter at a pizza restaurant, and the manager wanted uh, the waiters to keep the tickets open uh, because uh, they basically get uh, higher sales data, which is good for managers. Uh, you know, if the tickets are kept open and you don't like close a ticket and then open up another one in case people want beer or dessert or another order of breadsticks. And so uh, he said that I want you to keep your tickets open and so we're going to have a contest during these certain times. Whoever has the highest sales will get tickets to a Cincinnati Reds baseball game with a Beach Boys pre-show. And so basically each one of the waiters had to basically do the calculation. Uh, if I keep the tickets open, will that lead to high sales? And the answer for everybody was pretty much, yeah, 100%. That's how you have high, the highest sales possible. Uh, and then, so, so then you have to ask yourself, do I trust the manager? That is, if I get the highest sales, uh, will, uh, I, will the manager give me the reward? And, uh, you know, let's give that a 90%. You know, manager was pretty trustworthy. I think things would have been honest. Uh, but then, do I really want to see the Beach Boys or baseball? Uh, and I, that was zero for me. So, even though, uh, you know, one of the factors was zero in there, uh, I did win the contest, and so I gave the tickets to the second runner-up. Or I told the manager to give it to the second runner-up. Uh, so that is like a bad example. Uh, of a uh, VIE model, but that's how it works. But I really like the idea that you're recognizing that it's based on probabilities. You could do a fantastic job, however, it may not be noticed. Or people could recognize that you're doing a great job, but it may not lead to a reward. And, uh, you know, that's important to a couple other things that, you know, ideas that kick around in my head about, you know, psychology and statistics and the meaning of life or human nature, which is much bigger than we can get into today. Okay, so today is Halloween for me while I'm recording this. So here's a Halloween picture. Bye-bye.